<laughs> it has come out well. Probably. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, this neatly we mm -hmm. did with the hull. Ar arranged, yeah, nice. Nice work, yep. <laughs> Okay, uh, while the system is coming up, um, I want to talk to you guys about, in general, you know, so I mentioned yesterday that uh, today's lecture is dedicated to geotechnical investigation. And um, so most of the geotech, because it's underground, sometimes, okay, you cannot see, so you have to use non-intrusive, non-destructive testing methods, okay? And most of those are what we call the geophysical testing method, okay? And so um, it takes a lot of um, not guesswork, but analysis method, okay? And so from an inverse engineering perspective, okay, uh, geophysics, because you don't know what's underneath, the interpretation of the results is heavily dependent on your knowledge of the location, what has been done to the site, okay? For example, if there's any underground coal mine, okay? And what kind of rock formation? Is it limestone? Is it mostly shell or some other kind of um, minerals? Even how the area is formed, okay? So you get into an area where it's very inverse problem, okay? And uh, much more than the structural perspective. So, um, this is a, a cicada tree, okay? In, it's the oldest, oldest tree in the world, okay? And so this one is uh, the Smithsonian just published, the oldest, oldest tree ever, okay? Six, 16 million years old. Do you know how they, they count the age of the tree? You go by the rings, right, yeah. So. If this is 16 million years, somebody must have spent a lot of time counting the rings, okay? Which is not easy. The reason is because as the trees grow older, many things they will experience, okay? A super storm that may bring part of the trees down, and then they regrow from the, the, the bark, you know, the, the, the stem. And so you, you can see from the history of this tree, many, many things that happened in the past, okay? And uh, there are people who doesn't believe that, you know, the earth is that old, okay? But if we believe in the, the tree ring counting method, okay, that, you know, that, that should be very consistent, okay? But even so, 16 million counting throughout this tree is a very complex process, okay? And so the, 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 based on the rings of a tree, for a very simple young tree, it is a very consistent process, okay? Because you, you know how, why they have, you know, they go through every season. So the new cells, new cells dies out and then they push further and further, right? And so for a very young tree, that principle works pretty good. But when you go to a tree that old, it gets very complicated, okay? And so I imagine many people will probably argue about this 16 million year, okay? I mean, 16 million, that takes a long time to count, right? And many times you, you, you count wrong and, yeah. So this is, this is the kind of things that uh, we need to uh, recognize when we do geotechnical investigation. And geoforensics are actually cross-domain. Okay, so of course, geotechnical, geomechanics, right? Dam failures, 
retaining wall failures, all these are categorically defined. But then you may be getting into areas where like ge geological engineering, okay? So geological engineering are actually real discipline offered in some uh, schools in the United States, okay? And those are people who may be involved in natural landmark like landslides, okay, slope stability problems, or even mining, collapse, subsidence, and so forth, okay? And then there's a more recent geoenvironmental, okay? So it deals with man-made uh, environmental structures that, such as landfill, okay? So landfill has a lot of problems. So investigation of landfills is uh, falls under geoenvironmental area, okay? But you also have other cross-discipline, such as mining, especially underground mining. A lot of times, when you open up a hole in the ground, okay, it, come, it becomes a natural process for groundwater to seep in. Okay? So groundwater flows underground, but whenever you have a cut in the path of the groundwater, the, the pressure differential will cause groundwater to seep out. Okay, and then, then you have what we call the pool water problem. And that can be environmental. Because if you're in a coal mine, it, the water may become acidic. Okay, and then the water flows back into the groundwater. Then you become an environmental problem. Okay, people will be drinking from this acidic groundwater. Okay, so you quickly realize that it, in, in geotech alone, there are a lot of cross-domain uh, expertise involved. Okay, and then so... Again, going back based on the description of the mode of geotechnical failures, okay, so all these are geotechnical. So you, you see the, the uh, definitions are probably familiar to most of you, okay? Settlement problems, stability problems, bearing capacity uh, failures, lateral earth pressure for retaining wall. Okay, so retaining wall can be structural, can be geotechnical, okay, because especially if it's a reinforced structure. You know, the failure of, of that can be due to the soil pushing or the stability of the, so active or passive pressure failure uh, should be a job that's structural and geotech combined, okay? And then you have uh, yield, soil yielding problems, unanticipated static and dynamic loading, earthquake, okay, or, or uh, foundation vibration problems and so forth, okay? And then ground uplift. Ground uplift is usually because of a, uh, uh, either buoyancy, such as if you build a structure on a lake or in a lake, okay? So the, 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 the hydraulic pressure may, may become a uplift. But we also seen some of the light structures, you know, light foundation structures that may be uh, lifted due to other mechanisms, such as soil suction. Okay, so, so you quickly realize that uh, uplift is a uh, very significant problem, which is not common, but it happens, okay? Drag down is the reverse of uplift, okay? So the soil suction literally pulls the, 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 the light structure, light, lightweight foundation downwards, okay? And then liquefaction. And then leachate is more a geo-environmental type of problem, okay? bad chemicals, heavy metals that seeps into the groundwater, okay? Groundwater contamination and so forth. Oh, so we already have gr uh, ground uplift up there, okay? And then uh, the geotechnical systems are usually harder to quantify, okay? So we know retaining wall, we know dams, we know bridge foundations, abutments, and so forth, okay? And within it, it also separates into deep foundation and shallow foundation type. Okay, so, so from a profiling perspective, geotech can be cut categorically distinguished into to those different types, okay? Uh, tunnels is a very special area, okay? So, but tunnel can, can vary, okay? So uh, I investigate a particular tunnel project, but then, you know, the DOT actually claimed that is a bridge. So it was really an overhead Covered that you know you have cars passing on the top and then you have cars passing underneath. So depends on your perspective. It's a tunnel and it's a bridge. Okay, so 
you have those kind of uh, very unique systems. Okay, so keeping in mind uh, the definition of any of those are based on perspectives. Uh, and there are some failed underground systems, uh, especially unique is uh, piping. Okay, so, so sewer lines or underground pipeline, and in the U.S., now there are a lot, especially the, in, the introduction of Google Fiber. So for higher speed uh, internet, we do a lot of, uh, yeah. And, and those are short term constructions, okay? So actually one of the problem with roadways and highways is not so much failure of the system, but the failure because of trenching. They have to dig the holes on the side of the road. And every time that you have to, to, to disturb the soil on the existing roadways, it will immediately introduce a problem that will subside, okay? Uh, a typical cycle is within three years, you will see the pavement cracking, okay? And those are very expensive to repair, but uh, you know, it's still relatively cheaper than repave the entire roads, okay? So those are, are critical techniques that, uh, I mean, issues that you have to keep in mind, okay? And then as I mentioned, groundwater fluctuations or variations, uh, groundwater is dynamic, okay? They don't always stay the same, you know, profile. And so anytime that you, especially in the region, you have heavy constructions, you will cause the uh, groundwater table to change, okay? And that fluctuation may bring uh, slope failures and, and different kind of uh, ground problem. Okay, so those are critical issues. And then uh, in this day and age, most of the time, especially in the city, you are very likely to be built on top of a uh, old construction. Okay, so you may be uh, building on top of a landfill or uh, a residential area that the soil is actually disturbed. Okay, and so as a result, there will be failures. But the failure, you know, if you only know about the, the natural condition of the soil and not knowing the history of the site, then uh, your diagnostics may be wrong. Okay, so those are critical issues to recognize. Uh, I wanted to show you some case studies from the Philippines. Okay, uh, so in the Philippines, after Haiyan, we went on, on site and we see a lot of coastal erosions, okay? And so this is a, a, a sea wall that was breached uh, because of very strong waves, okay? And so uh, for doing this analysis, but of course this could also happen when the, the concrete sea wall was eroded over time, okay? So going back and trying to determine how much was the force actually forcing the wall to collapse is a very challenging work, okay? And, and so this kind of analysis, you know, you have to know the existing structure, how it was built and so forth, okay? And then, uh, uh, of course, the erosion of this beach area becomes a really critical issue, okay? So, uh, Beach erosion, especially in the tourist environment, okay, can be a very lucrative, uh, lucrative job for civil engineers, okay, because it's not common, okay. But you have to remember this itself is a system, okay. So uh, when you involve in this kind of projects, you need to know, you know, wh how was the beach built, okay. There are a lot of artific artificial beaches, okay. So you know, I remember growing up, I go to, we go to Thailand for vacations. And then I was sitting on the beautiful white sand beach. And then my hand was digging, you know, trying to build a castle. You know, little kids do that. And then I suddenly found plastic sheets underneath. You know, those are geotextiles. And so you realize that, wow, even this beautiful, seemingly natural beach is not so natural. Okay. And it's actually an engineered system. So underneath the uh, white sand, you have uh, geotextiles that protects erosion of that beach, okay? So knowing all this, then uh, you know how to design, especially when the system fell, okay? Like how much the, the, the 
the resistance, the frictional resistance of the geotextile was designed originally. Okay, so those are critical issues, and whether it was pinned. Okay, so geotextiles are usually nailed to the natural soil. Okay, so all these are critical elements when you deal with the erosion problem. And then uh, coastline erosion, again, you know, this is a, a extreme case. Okay, so you have all these erosions due to heavy waves, okay, impact. And uh, usually it's very difficult for you to assess the, the impact. But you can see that the erosion is into the, uh, the, the, the grass area, and all this, you know, the loss of the soil and stuff can be costly to the, uh, the owner of this site, okay? And then uh, this is a highway pavement that was being built over another eroded area, okay? So you can see from the, uh, the, the, the paved area, know that this place has been disturbed, okay? So it, it's not an ideal site for you to, to do any kind of assessment, okay? And then, uh, yeah, more, more scouring. And uh, actually, highway pavement damage, uh, forensic, can be a, a challenging work because uh, you may not be able to see this, but uh, there was a heavy uh, sewer pipeline built underneath the highway. Okay, so the idea is to drain the water from that side into the ocean. Okay, but, but when you have this kind of impacts, then the, the damage of the, uh, the whole system is, is, will happen. Okay, uh, and then natural slope failures. Okay, so so uh, for this kind of analysis, you 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 wanted to know what was the soil saturation. You know where were the, was the groundwater uh, before the storm and during the storm, so that you can do the slope stability analysis and also which kind of analysis technique needs to be done. Okay, so all these are are more related to geotech. Okay. And then uh, some scouring such as this, uh, while it is, you know, obvious, it is difficult to determine whether this system is actually stable. Okay, so how much was the damage to this to the system becomes critical. And also, when you come here and then do the assessments, how much of this was happening due to daily storm? Okay, it, it's another area of forensic interest. Okay, so. When you look at a site, it is really important for you to have a, a holistic approach to, to the assessment. Okay, so you look around, not just for that problem area, but you also have to work around. So we recall, we work around this area. This is only about uh, maybe 10 meters from the actual uh, wave, you know, the beach area. But when we walk into the, um, further into the, uh, the, the compound, we actually found even more erosions, you know, another 10, 20 meters in. So what happened here is this kind of scouring actually is, is more due to the storm uh, surge. In other words, uh, the wave may impact and, and, and scour, okay? But there's another kind of scour is when the, the, the water sustained a long time over the area, and then when the water re withdraw, it take, actually takes a lot of materials with it, okay? And that kind of force, it's kind of like a suction force. It's actually very significant, and it will not happen in, right away, okay? Storm surge usually take hours to subside, kind of like a tsunami, okay? So, so those are the, uh, the critical elements to, to recognize. Okay, then uh, geophysical investigation. Okay, so this, um, this is a building it had nothing to do with coastal area, okay, but it's a building next to a pond, okay, and so for this particular building, they actually found sinkhole within the building or near the building. So how do we, how can we uh, prevent the, uh, the sinkhole from continuing to happen? So one of the theory. Uh, that the, uh, the, the geotechnical company is doing the repair work is that they believe the groundwater fluctuation from the lake 
you know, the lake water is not always level, but it's so close to the building that the, the seepage into underneath the building actually caused the uh, erosion, okay? And so uh, one solution to this, and, and this is one of the few cases where I actually involve in the uh, repair of a uh, existing engineering problem. So to resolve this, the, uh, the company Bate engage us to determine. So their solution to solve this problem is actually build a, uh, a grout curtain. In other words, they will inject concrete and then creating like an underground concrete wall so that the, the, the seepage will not attack to the building foundation anymore. Okay, And so uh, this is the, the, the grouting mechanism. So they would drill a big hole and then they pump concrete into the uh, the ground, okay? And so the injection of uh, grout would require you to know where would that curtain wall be, okay? So uh, you need to know where is the, 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 the seeping of water coming from. So this is the scenario. So this is the pond. Okay, I have to backtrack. So actually, before we were engaged, they don't really know how the sinkholes were formed, okay? And so... Uh, before they decide to to grout, these are the sinkhole areas. Okay, so uh, we did uh, several geophysical testing. So you can see we did the the surface wave testing: one area, two area, three area, four, five, six, seven around the building. Okay, so basically wanted to see what is the geological setting of that area looks like. Okay. And so you can see from test one, two, I just demonstrate one, two, three, because one, two, three is surrounding on the exterior of the structure, the system. So no, notice that the analysis actually would tell, the same testing method actually tell you different things, okay? So How do you make these boreholes, Professor? You go by machine drilling? Or yeah, machine, the, machine drilling, yeah, okay. yeah. They drill and then they use the same hole to inject, yeah. So, uh, the one, two, three, four test actually tells you the uh, rock formation because they are outside of the building, right? And then the five, six, seven actually tells you the foundation condition. Okay, how much sinkhole was forming and and how bad it is. Okay, so so from the outside test, just showing you test one, two, three. You notice that one and three, the bedrock is shallow. Okay. And uh, two, the bedrock is, is higher, okay? The, the competent rock, I should say. Okay, so two is here, and then one and three are actually on the two opposite sides to the, uh, the pond, okay? And uh, after talking to the, uh, the geotechnical engineers and, and so forth, we decided... So you mean to say from that graph... Yeah. The soil profile, is, mm -hmm. the topography is changing. Right. Yeah. Uh, between these. Two. Yes. Yeah. So, so we believe that you know, two and three, I mean, yeah, uh, no, one and three one involve and more sinkhole. Yeah, and then two, in that direction, there is no sinkhole. Yeah. And that's how we we uh, we so two is around here, and then and then uh, one and three, right? So we, this is where they decide to build the uh, concrete grout because they believe the groundwater, you know, the runoff is this direction, but the seepage damaging to the erosion. Yeah. Because of the pond location, we get this sort of uh, yeah, yeah. effect. Right. Uh, as, uh, as the days progress. Right. It seeps into. Uh, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Seepage. Occurs. Right. Yeah. It causes the, 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 the soil to subside. Yeah. And so, so this is where, at the end, where they did the, the grout curtain. Okay, so this is, this is the kind of analysis that you would do and benefit from. Now, uh, as I mentioned, um, so this is an aerial image, uh, and uh, Harid asked me a lot about this. So this, this, uh, all these uh, indentations on the uh, ground surface is all because of the underground mine subside. Okay, and this doesn't happen overnight. It happens over years. Okay, so uh, a common practice in the U.S. 
in the old days, 70s, 60s, and even earlier, is once you ex excavate the mine, you leave it, you just close the mine so people don't go in there and play, okay? But you don't go and backfill all the mines, okay? And so this is the problem in the future, okay? So you will see the, the surface of uh, subside. And uh, these are the lucky cases, you actually see the surface indentation. There are some of the mines, you know, you own the property, but you don't see on the surface that there are actually mine collapse. Okay, and so those are the, the ones that are dangerous. But as per the government rules, uh, we are supposed to uh, refill no. it and... We no, no, you're not, road. yeah, you don't have to backfill, uh, yeah. I mean, a lot of these old mines before the government has any policies, yeah. Even today, we don't do that. So, uh, I was explaining uh, last night, uh, the mining, there are two mining techniques. For, uh, for oh, those, okay. Uh, one method is called the room and pillar. Okay, so room and pillar methods, you dig into the mines and then you leave uh, chunks of uh, concrete as pillars to support the structure, okay? And uh, the, um, the mining engineers are usually the one that study. In fact, we recently have a paper published, so we review all the design techniques, you know, and uh, unfortunately many of those are, are not conservative enough. Okay, so, so you imagine over, over time, as I mentioned, groundwater will seep in, start eroding those, uh, those columns. And so from the side view, you have the, the roof. Okay, and then this is the room, and this is the pillar. Okay, so if the overburden pressure starts to pushing down, and the... Uh, if the roof is not strong enough, it will collapse. Okay? And more likely is this actually start give away because you have a strong stress concentration here. Okay? And so the columns would actually buckle. Yeah. Okay, so this is what happened to most of the mines. So people would think, okay, so if it buckles, no problem because you're looking at maybe several you know, one, two thousand feet below. So if you have compared to the relative, this is the area that you're looking at, you know, relatively, because the, the, uh, the height usually is like four or five feet, okay? So if you have one thousand feet, there shouldn't be problem. But actually, that's not true, because you can have significant subsidence when this collapse. Okay, so, so you, you quickly realize that this is a, a real problem. Okay, that's why most of those properties, they are not sold. Okay, and the, uh, only the local people live. Okay, now, I also mentioned in China, so this kind of construction, you may get 46% of the coal out, and then the remaining, you leave it. Yeah. I think it's not right. Oh, okay. But in, in, in e some Eastern Europe and uh, uh, China, their mining technique is based on uh, a, a, a technique that uh, they use a machine. So in the back of the machine, the, the front of the machine is a big uh, excavator. It digs, okay? And then in the back, they actually backfuse the, the soil and then compacts. Okay, so you, you get a, you get more coal out. Okay, so you will be you'll be excavating line by line by line by line. Okay, so you actually have materials that you you backfill the mines. So that that's the safer way to do it. Okay, and, and you actually get more coal out of the ground. Okay, so this is a. Uh, but but in the America now we're doing most of the time mountain top blasting rather than uh, long wall mining or deep deep mining okay so so uh, so surface mining has other related problems 
Okay, but you don't get this kind of subsidence issues. Okay, uh, so this this gives you some general sense. Okay, over time that we know that with groundwater fluctuations and uh, different ero erosion mechanisms, the uh, rock and the soil will give up their strength, and then it will collapse. And as it collapses, you have surface subsi subsidence. Okay, and in some cases you may have sinkholes or sinkhole equivalents, you know, ground void formings. Okay, so uh, sinkhole formations are very common in, in this uh, coal mine areas, okay, underground mine areas, and uh, you can often see that even, uh, there are some areas the roads are so bad, the uh, DOT, Department of Transportation decide to completely remove themselves because it takes a lot of money to repair. I mean, the holes are huge, okay? So just to get the material to backfill takes a lot of time, okay, and a lot of uh, efforts. I think this sort of action happened recently in Chennai also, for example. Oh. Uh, well, the sinkhole on the uh -huh. road. Yes, right? yep, and foam. But they were claiming that uh, some underground uh, tunneling metro uh, was going on and they immediately blame uh -huh. within two three days. Yeah, uh, but they don't know what was the root cause. Okay. The PWD engineers were uh, uh, too confused. Right. Yeah. So it was a uh, main uh, main road. Uh huh. Uh, I don't know what place is that. You uh, have you heard about that? Uh, Madhya Galish. Madhya Galish. Yes. Okay. Uh huh. Suddenly, I think one yeah. car uh, drop drop in. It got trapped. <laughs> Uh huh. Yeah. So in Florida, we have uh, limestone. In Florida, this is very common problem. In, in fact, uh, last year the whole house dropped into a sinkhole. The biggest sinkhole I think uh, they have found maybe several hundred feet wide. Okay. But th those are due to uh, limestone, which is calcium based. So underground water actually eats out, and then you have karst formation. Okay, that's that's a more common formation of a sinkhole. But sinkhole can be many reasons. A lot of roads that are not properly compacted, you know, rain may seep under and then take out the soil, and you you have another sinkhole forming. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, cast. Yeah. So so cast is where you have a lot of limestone forming okay and then the uh, those are the most likely candidates for sinkholes because the groundwater will eat the calcium you know uh, because uh, you know you, you will become weak acidic effect yeah okay so you need to if, if you're involved in this you need to know your geological formations where are the likely so this area is uh, most of the coal coal mines were done, okay, in the Black Warrior area, and uh, and further down here you have less coal, but you have seams, you know, of different uh, formations, okay, so these are all lignite mines, okay. And uh, so the investigation is you, you go to the site, you look at the uh, what happened in the area. Usually, we would cover a wider area because you know that if it's a coal mine, the subsidence will not be just one hole. There will be something similar, you know. So, so going around, uh, checking out the ne whole neighborhood, looking for sinkholes is a very good indication. Okay, and again, the reason is because the most of these are involved old mines, so they were not GPS based. So you have to be able to to tell from the old map where the mines are, okay? And then you, you go in there and, and verify. And then you usually do a geophysical testing. Oh, what did I do again? Oh, okay. You do geophysical testing, and then you create your hypothesis, okay? And then you validate with the mine map. Okay, so uh, this is, this yeah. This sort of sinkholes is possibly only in weaker soils. Yes. Uh, but uh, strong soils, can we get this sort of uh, effect? 
Yes, possible? there is possible. So, so if, especially if it's a compacted soil, uh, man-made soil, so it's usually the grading is not so uh, like natural soil. So when groundwater seeps through, it, it will wash them out. Yeah. Once it loses that compaction, they, 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 they yeah, it, it, it just go away. If the denseness is lost, then naturally. Yeah, the, the problem will continue and continue and continue. Yeah. And so this is uh, what we usually do, like an uh, algorithm. So you do the, you, you recognize mine subsidence, and uh, this is the investigation process, okay? So you know there's a damage to the property, so you do the forensic investigation. You first do the visual inspection. You create assumptions and theories, and then you take the proper tools to do either uh, geophysical testing, visual inspections, or do a mapping correlation, okay? And uh, so uh, in some areas, then the challenge is, can you distinguish between is it cost or is it mining subsidence? So now, now we are talking about shifting the blame, okay? If it's uh, mine related, then obviously you go after the mining company, right? And if it's a uh, natural sinkhole, then you know, then they don't have a case. So th this is where you know most of the arguments will come in, okay? In the in in the court fight, okay? So in this case, uh, the structure is actually on top of the the mines, okay? So you can see that. We lay out the uh, the the mine design, okay, scaled it up to the area, okay, and you can actually see how the building was on top of those, okay. Now you cannot go in and do detailed, you know, exactly tell. Okay, this sinkhole must be on top, like like what we were mapping here. These are all the identified sinkholes on the property, okay. But some of them are on top of a uh, pillar, you know. The, the, the damage mechanism is too complicated. So by being able to identify the sinkholes, you pretty much nail the case, okay? And then we do the uh, surface wave testing method. Okay. So this is the property, okay, and with the owner sitting in the front, okay, and uh, the property has a lot of, and, and this is a actual Google map showing the location and the overlay, overlay with the uh, map, map uh, coal mine map, okay? And then you can see the building has already sustained the structural damage. So the cracking pattern, whenever you see a continuous crack, that means it's structural, okay? Something from the foundation must have happened, okay? Or the surface. And then uh, this is the chimney. So you can see the chimney is actually bulging. So the differential ground settlements are causing many, and the, and the chimney is separating from the remaining of the wall, the brick wall, okay? And then uh, you see a lot of sinkholes on the ground. Okay, so, so being able to go to the site and then look for those sinkholes becomes critical. A single sinkhole may not tell you a lot. Some, sometimes those sinkholes, especially the small ones, may be snake hole. Okay, so big snake lives in there. So you have to be careful. You don't use a rod to, to, to disturb the snake, okay? And so when we do the uh, SASW testing, notice that the curves are not as clean as some of the cases that I, I showed you before. And the reason is because the disturbance of a uh, mine settlement, okay, it's actually very complicated. Okay, so we're not looking at a sinkhole as a big void. Sometimes it does happen, okay, but most of the time it was the big rocks start collapsing and then you have a lot of debris, rocks, smaller rocks and so forth, okay, until it gets to the top. So the analysis of those results are usually not as clean as an actual sinkhole due to cost. Okay, so, and, and, and uh, if you have ever been to a cavern, underground cavern, you know, see the, uh, 
the the uh, the the dangling uh, limestones and so forth. Those are the the bigger sinkholes that will form over many 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 years, hundreds of years. Okay, and so uh, nature's karst formation, the sinkholes will be much more well defined, but mine settlements are m much more disturbed, and as a result, you see our geophysical data becomes more disturbed. Okay, but still, looking at this data, you can still create some kind of uh, opinion. Okay, so for this particular case, and this is how we usually do, we will define our opinion. So we found very shallow stiff soil within 10 feet. In other words, the reason the building hasn't disappeared is because the surface soil has not fully disturbed. So they are still stiff, okay? But then uh, we cannot, def we don't have well-defined sinkholes, okay? And so uh, the fact that the uh, test one and two are consistent shows that the, the site has stability, okay? We don't envision the building disappear anytime. There is a trailer nearby. So other than the house, there's actually a, the owner has a trailer. So trailer is a pre-engineered house, kind of like, a, um, you know, the, the containers on the truck, okay? So in America, people use that to live in, okay? And that container actually has one end of the support settled, okay? So we know that it's sinking. So we know the problem can, can be significant, okay? And then uh, we, because the site is on top of a, we, we prove that it's on top of a coal mine. So we pretty much conclude that, you know, that, that is the cause of all the problems to the structure. Okay, and this is, shows the, our uh, soil testing. This is how we lay out the, the test. Okay. Now, how to uh, rectify this effect structure? Uh, we, can do, we can go for some lime stabilization process? Uh, no. For so, for this kind of uh, problem, you need to drill a hole and then grout. No. Yeah, you, the yeah, the only way to solve it the problem. Can be either lime grout or cement yeah. Grout. Now, you can also uh, uh, use micro pile micro yeah so micro piles are not like the real piles that are big micro piles are are you can the machine for micro pile are actually very light so you can put it close to the building and then put the piling down okay you can make many many piles and then kind of supports the structure so you will not settle but still you are not i mean the the long term solution is still grout yeah but you have to go into the mine, cha mine shaft and then grow the mine shaft. Yeah, that takes a lot of concrete. Yeah. Because we don't know what would be the depth. It will be you don't. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You don't know. Yeah. So in that case, then you need to drill a big hole underneath. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is. Uh, uh, so we spend a lot of time using Google Map and then uh, put the. Uh, the uh, the mine map on top, okay, and uh, because the old mines, as I mentioned, they are not GPS re geo referenced, so being able to to match them is a very challenging work, okay, and we look for features such as this is an existing river. We know the river was there even when the mines were active, okay. So using the mine map, we actually found the river feature on the mine map then uh, we are able to tell the scale of both the mine setting, okay? And uh, this is the analysis. So you have a building damage. You found there is a building damage. The first question you ask is, is, is it within a mine zone, okay? If yes, then uh, you, you pretty much don't have to argue anymore because usually the lawyers has a strong case claiming that the building was collapsed because of mine, okay? And then, of course, uh, you can do geophysical testing to determine if there's mine void. If there is a, a mine void, then you know your case will be even stronger. Okay, but typically we don't get to see that because um, this is another thing about geophysical testing. If you have disturbed soil, then the wave cannot travel so far. Okay, and also um, when you do the geophysical testing, 
it's very unlikely that you can reach that depth using surface impact. Okay, if you wanted to tell where are the mine shaft, then you really have to use some other innovative techniques such as uh, a passive, just by listening to the ground vibration, and detect how deep the the, the mine voids is. Okay. And then if you have any other evidences, okay? So if you can find a mine entrance nearby, that automatically tell you this is a mined area, okay? And then uh, you usually have a basic two conclusions. Is it due to abandoned mine collapse or due to not for mine collapse? You only have two solutions, okay? And uh, this is uh, another case study. So this case, the demonstrations to show you. So this is actually a big manufacturing plant, okay? And uh, they wondered if they're they're gonna install a heavy machine, but they are worried that the uh, the the foundation is not strong enough. So we do the geophysical testing for them to see if the the foundation is competent, okay? So this is the the general scenario. So you have the building, you have the working area and where they're going to put the heavy foundation, I mean heavy machinery. And then you have ground, underground water pipeline, and then there are grass lane and parking. So this is a constructed site, okay? And uh, the goal for us is to go in and, and see if there's any, anything that's happening underneath, okay? And so we did the soil testing. So the purpose of showing you this is to show you the 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 signal processing process, okay? So you have two sensors, and then you can construct a phase diagram. This is called a phase diagram, okay? And based on the phase diagram, and all these are based on frequency, so you can back calculate the depth and the wave speed, okay, by using the, the angle phi, okay? So this represents one, one wave speed, another wave speed, another wave speed, okay? And then using the software, you can block off all the noise data, okay? But uh, this techniques is not um, straightforward. You have to assume the soil property, okay? Because when you do the testing, you're based on measure wave speed, right? So everything else you have to assume. So you have to assume the soil properties, and you also have to, to visually see, like here, we block it off because we can't really see a cycle. Okay, so a lot of these are manual analysis, okay, based on the experience and so forth. Okay, so so this is, the reason I present this is, uh, you know, I have not yet encountered a case where the court would scrutinize, saying that, hey, your analysis is wrong, okay? But if they were to bring this issue up, you know, then it would be very difficult for me to explain why do I recognize this as the cycles when all of this I ignored, okay? Yeah, it just, it, it's based on experience, okay? And so, so that, that can be challenging. And as you can see, the results are very, very disturbed. And this is velocity wave versus wavelength, okay? So in geophysical testing, the typical procedure is you do the vibration sensing, right? you assume the distance between the sensors. So for deeper soil, you move the sensors further, so the horizontal distance become larger, and then you have to use a much stronger force, okay? And once you get the signals from the two sensors, they are related by the distance, okay? And so you have to calculate the transfer function between the two, okay? Once you create a transfer function, then you have to do what we call the forward modeling. In other words, it's not straightforward. Okay, so the, the procedure is when you do the, uh, the testing here and here, you kind of generate a, uh, a set of curves, okay? And then you construct the velocity versus wavelength, okay? And then you do the forward modeling. You assume, hey, I have this soil, okay? And this is uh, density one, density two, density three, density four, and so forth. And then you, you calculate what is the profile, and then you use that wave speed to match this line. 
Okay, so you quickly realize that this is this is not something done overnight. It takes days to do this processing. Okay, and then because you have to match this line versus this line, okay, your assumption becomes a uh, inverse problem. Meaning, I can assume 500 lines, or I can assume five lines, or I can assume 50 lines. It becomes an optimization problem, okay? And uh, you cannot simulate so many times, right? And if you assume 500 lines, every one is like only a few inches thick, it's not reasonable. So it based on a lot of your experience, okay? And, and so this kind of analysis, it gives you some data, but it's mostly for reference, okay? And it's not a strong, uh, strong evidence. Okay, it is a, it is an evidence, but it's not a strong evidence. Okay, and so you can see uh, this is another set of data, and and my student and I will argue: should we throw this data away because they are so far away? It's not easy to match a curve. Okay, but uh, you know we we would debate, and then once you create the uh, wave and wave and velocity curve, it looks like this, okay? This particular curve alone tells me that the, uh, the pavement on top is very strong, okay? And, and that is why you suddenly have this singular, singular effect, okay? And uh, this is our final analysis. So you can see that the slab is very powerful, but then after that you have consistent soil for about 1,000 to 1,500 uh, feet per second wave speed. Okay, so this this is wrong. This, uh, something is missing. This foot per second. Okay, it's wave speed. And so, in summary, is that we demonstrate the slab is very strong. It's almost like a rock. Okay, and uh, the actual is the the slab was about five feet deep. So they have anticipation that you know there will be, and then uh, but the soil underneath is clay, you know because it's about one thousand feet per second. So we think it's clay, and also because we kind of know the area. And we have not found any, any uh, uh, bedrock at 40 feet, okay, beyond. Okay, so, so, they, um, so they ask, you know, in this particular case, we just provide the data. We didn't tell them, should you or should not you build your uh, machine on top of this foundation, okay? And uh, let the geotech engineer decide, make that decision. Okay, because this data alone is not going to tell them enough information about what the foundation will be. Okay, so in order to actually determine if the foundation is competent for their machine, I actually have to calculate how much the machine weighs. Okay, and then what kind of uh, boundary condition, how, what kind of uh, support system they design for the structure. And then we have to do a different test is by using the shaker to vibrate the, the ground so that we can determine how much it will actually influence on your vibration frequency. Okay, so the, all these are, again, additional work that we could have done, but then the, uh, the client will have to cover more money because then I have to rent a shaker and, and do all that testing. Okay, so again, not a perfect solution, but we give the client sufficient data for them to make a decision, okay? And so by being telling them that uh, the foundation is stiff and then the soil underneath is clay, you can use uh, Richard Woods and Hall, you know, the uh, uh, foundation vibration classic textbook, and they have solutions that you can go and pick up whether that would be able to qualify for this kind of design, okay? So I think uh, most uh, Indian students have structured dynamic Right. So in structured dynamic, you have the single long mass model for e elastic foundation problem. You can build one of those models based on the weight of the machine and assume stiff spring constants. And then you do a bunch of analysis and determine, you know, whether th this will support that will cause a di disturbance from the vibration. Okay. Now going to a famous case. Okay. So this is the. Uh, San Francis Dam uh, in uh, San Francisco Quito National Park, California. Okay, uh, so this dam is one of the first 
concrete. San Francisco is different and San Francisco is different. Yes. Different yeah. Place. No, actually San Francisco is the short of San Francisco. Quito, okay? But it's not the same as San Francisco. Oh, okay. Yeah. So this area is actually closer to Los Angeles than San Francisco. Okay. And uh, this dam was uh, designed built by a very famous dam engineer in at that time, you know, we're talking about 1920s, okay? His name is w William Mulholland, okay? He is not a train engineer, okay? And you have to remember, in 1920s, in Europe, they built a lot of concrete dam. But in the U.S., at that time, we only have earth dam or rock dam, okay? So William Mulholland, you know, and, and you see in history many, many times, the Americans trying to match up to the European technology. So he started building concrete dams, okay? Even though he's not a trained engineer, he's self-learned, and, uh, you know, he had definitely no qualification for concrete, but he started designing concrete dams, okay? So he's a very hardworking, and he's not even a geologist, okay? And so all of this lacking of his background actually go into the forming of the theory of why this dam fell. Okay, but this was a, a famous dam at that time, and I, and and I just give you a little background. So, uh, California, even though it's on the west coast of United States, it's actually very dry. It's more like a desert. Okay, so water is has always been a problem for Los Angeles. Okay, the whole pretty much the whole coastal area. Okay, and so to to supply water to California, that early on in the turn of the century, of the 19th century, they actually already uh, have grand plans of building a lot of man-made canals to supply water, okay? And so this is actually part of the, um, the uh, Owens Valley Aqueduct, okay? So I have driven over, those are big, big aqueducts they built, okay? And uh, it's actually, you know, bring the waters from, from all the way up in the mountains down to the L.A. area, okay? And so uh, the dam was actually built, San Francisco Dam was actually built as the first concrete dam in the U U.S., okay? And then uh, the, uh, the dam is trying to... This was before Hoover, uh, Hoover Dam. Oh, yeah, way before Hoover Dam. Way before, yeah. So, so, but um, William Mulholland, you know, wanted this grand project. He was at the time the head of the uh, Los Angeles uh, uh, Bureau of Water and um, Water and something else. Yeah. So he's the head, and and he do all the design himself. You know. So he studies very very hard. He self learned concrete technology, self learned geology, and so forth and so forth. Okay. So. This is the remaining of the dam today, okay? So, you know, the, all, that, all that grand dual monuments is already gone, and you only have this, okay? But it is built in the San Francisco Canyon, okay? So the idea is the dam would flood the entire canyon, okay? And then uh, it's very close to the LA Aqueduct, okay? And has very unique topology, and also, from a geological sense, it's close to several fault lines because it's just because it's in in California, okay. And uh, the the rock type is the Sespi conglomerate rock and uh, a lot of mica schist. So if you know a, a little bit about mica material, they are weak in shear, okay. So they 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 have a shear plan, okay. So Usually, this kind of rock will fall in a very distinct shear surface. Okay, and this is the construction of the dam. So it is uh, the Bureau of Water and Power. Okay, and it's a concrete gravity dam and it's an arc dam. Okay, it has a height of 185 feet. Actually, this is another thing that people criticize. So original design was 175 feet, and then when he submit the plan. I think a year before the uh, the construction, he 
himself added another 10 feet. Yeah, so become 185. Because at that time, there was, there was a discussion about how much capacity they actually need. So he increased that height and then increased the capacity. So the reservoir has 39 million meter cube of capacity. Okay, and also on top of increasing the height, he also added the wing dike. Okay, on the sides, all of that was just at the last minute. Okay, and so the dam was constructed between 1924 and 1926, and it was filled in 1926. Okay, so right after the the dam was constructed, they start filling water in, and uh, it has problems from the very beginning. Okay, so a lot of cracks start happening and then there are some leakage starts showing okay and so Mahalan actually would personally go and inspect every of those cracks and seepage okay and then determine if if it should be repaired some of the repair work later on would criticize that was not effective okay but but he was very thorough checking on the the uh, the, the 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 scenario okay so this is a uh, just to show you the perspective from a, a geospatial sense. So this is the Los Angeles Metropolitan. Okay, the San Francisco Dam is right here, and so this is the uh, San Francisco Valley area. So the intent was to flood this entire area, and now there's an existing dam not too far from this that was built after. Okay, and then uh, if, if if it floods this side of the valley. Okay, and uh, the distance from here to here, I think, is about 40 to 50 miles. So it's very close. It was built intended to help Los Angeles water supply. Okay, and uh, this is uh, this is the 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 remnant of the San Francisco Dam. Okay, and this is the ex existing dam that is very close to it. Okay. Nineteen twenty-six. Oh, it failed immediately. Yeah, immediately. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, this is a uh, Google again. Zoom in to show you. You know, right now you can't even see the 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 shape of the existing dam at all. You know, time kind of erased many many of the uh, evidence. Okay, except for those rubbles that was remaining from from that. Uh, Failure. Okay, so this was the 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 actual dam right after it was built. But you can see there's already a big leak, a big seepage. I think it was like 75 gallon per second waters coming out. Okay, 75 gallons not a lot, you know, com relative to the size. But but uh, you know, yeah. Well, actually, uh, a lot of concrete dams after you you design build they will have seepage they will have so you have to do repair yeah but uh, causing a drastic failure was not very common yeah and and you can see this is this is already they already start backfilling the uh, water behind the reservoir okay so only uh, the shear it is only due to the shear uh, we don't know. It's a geotech failure. It's a geotech failure, but but there are many theories behind. Yeah. And and this this project was done in the in the day when we don't have forensic engineering, so there are a lot of inspections, but you know there's no strong conclusion. Everybody has many many theories. Yeah. And and even the official solution was not you know many engineers doesn't accept the official answer yeah but you can see that you know the, this is this is what it was designed for to so how did he face the situation any history about that when such failure has occurred oh he answerable, right? he yeah he he lost his license and he retired right away yeah he never worked again yeah after this yeah so it's oh the implication is many many more yeah so so this this is just to show you so I actually superimposed the previous dam image to uh to the the Google Earth 3D 
just to show you the magnitude. So you can see the behind all this are supposed to be flooded. Okay, just to give you the uh, perspective. Okay, and uh, you, this this is drawing is uh, from the technical report. So people show where are the cracks. Okay, and the the unfortunate thing is some of the cracks actually tie into the the rock formation. You know, so then the question is: Is it concrete problem? Is it rock failure problem? Okay, and and also there are many fault lines in in this zone. Okay, and and so there are a lot of criticisms, but the uh, so there are many leaks and um, cracks, and the uh, oh so this is a, a picture oh seventeen liters per second was discharged from this one single crack. Okay, at that time, so they know there are. Problem. Okay, failure happens at, oh, no, two years after. Sorry, it was two, 1928, okay, when they are still back feeling behind. And it was a late night, and 430 people, basically a downstream village was completely washed away. Many, many people died, yeah. And uh, because it happens at, at late night, Nobody actually witnessed what happened. There, there's a watch person that, that went by, and he said he heard some really loud noise. Okay, and uh, but 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 you know because it's dark, so he can't see what, exactly so the, what, what happened. What about mica processor and mica substance? Yeah, have some direct contact with water. Uh-huh. Uh huh. How it behaves? Uh, I think mica over time will swell because I think there are some sodium. Yeah, in the material. Yeah, uh, it might be the cause of that. No, that that is one probable. Yeah, uh huh. Yeah, but but mica is not. You know, they don't form like large rocks. Yeah. They they usually are pockets of uh, materials in the. But but it usually that indicate. That area is fully uh, surrounded with mica. Yeah, so yeah, a lot of mica in that area. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, so there are many, many theories. Okay, one theory is because at that time people, there are people who protest because fighting for water. So at, at the time that he is filling up the dam, they actually have people, <coughs> excuse me, request water draining for power, for, for, for uh, applying water and, I mean, uh, for power generation. Yeah, thank you. And then um, there are others. There are you know people who protect the fish, and 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 so forth. So there are some evidence that support it. Oh, okay. I got it. Yeah, thank you. But then there's also contradicting evidence. So some people say it's earthquake, but there is no earthquake. So there are many theories that are being proposed, and uh, there are some dynamiting. So there are because this is not the only project ongoing in that area. So there are some other works related. So people were claiming that because of that work impact on this area. But most important is at that time, the Americans really don't know much about concrete material, especially for concrete mine, uh, dam construction. Yeah. So this again, um, there are some questionable issues also. Okay, so one of the theory was uh, at that time there was a strong debate about uplift relief. Okay, so uplift uplift relief is uh, the uplift is due to water pressure from from uh, underneath the dam. Okay, so what can you design the dam so that the gravity would prevent the mine from from experiencing uplift is uh, at that time there was no laws dictating you know how should you if you should provide any kind of provision okay and so that was one of the argument and then many people were talking about you know oh the the dam wasn't wide enough you know don't have enough gravity weight and so forth okay and uh, but he did uh, his work was you know so he he's a even though he's not a qualified engineer, but he is a good engineer, material person, you know. So he did a lot of calculation, and he saw all his calculations available for, for people to evaluate, okay. And then uh, another theory is that the construction was not good, okay. So there are a lot of evidence. One is 
you know, later on when people take the concrete material, they, they felt that the strength of the concrete was not strong enough, and uh, there's no expansion joints, contraction joints, there's no reinforcement, okay, and again, people argue about uplift relief, okay, so there are many, many criticisms towards him about his design, okay. But it's like an earthen dam on it. Huh? Yeah, but yes. Dam is an earthen dam. Yes, yeah, like, like the earthen dam. In that it, case, uh, concrete strength is not predominant. It's more, it's more like a gravity it's effect, more right? Gravity. Rather, yeah. But then uh, the, uh, the concrete should have sufficient material to pre prevent seepage. Only yeah. thing is we have to arrest the, uh, the cracks. Porosity. Yeah. Uh, that uh -huh. should not happen. Porosity, porosity, yes. Yep. Uh -huh. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so, so there were, uh, uh, you know, but, but these are all the theories people bring up and uh, criticize his work. And then, of course, you know, his lack of background geology is also another thing that people criticize. Uh, they claim that he didn't do enough investigation in the geology before the, uh, again, those uh, materials were blamed for failure. Conglomerate is a sedimentary rock, category. Yes, it, it's sedimentary. It, it's not uh, uh, like, like uh, uh, volcanic-based, yeah. So it's not strong, strong rock, yeah. And then, uh, and and but of course that area, you know, there's no history of ancient landslides and stuff, yeah. Okay, and then uh, people propose many, many other theories, such as why the West abutment failure initially. Okay, so again, insufficient geology. Inadequate excavation of the the incompetent rock, you know, for the forming, and then the uh, the lo location of the dam blocks after the failure is some of those arguments. Okay, so so uh, the the failure mode of the uh, later on will show the picture. Okay, it's actually not the whole dam being washed out. There are some columns left of materials left. Okay, and so. That leads to people come up with many, many, again, like the Malivakum yeah, case. How it fell, the shape of the remaining material always intrigues engineers and, and, and make people propose different suggestions. Yeah. And uh, this picture shows that uh, before the dam was completely collapsed, they actually go in there and look at uh, the, the cracks and the and failure and so forth. And there are many, many arguments, you know, all these are supporting evidence that people suggest that they have. Which is very significant. The failure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is, yeah. It's very large cracks, yeah. And this is the remaining of the, the dam. Okay. And so the so after that, you know, of course there will be a lot of changing of laws. Okay. So Dam safety was was start raised about this kind of dams, okay? And then uh, retrofits, how do we retrofit dams were discussed. And then, of course, uplift force relief is uh, one thing that now we have a provision against that kind of failure mode, okay? So, uh, the and then, of course, uh, Mulholland, as I mentioned, he lost his, you know, license and uh, he lost his practice. He basically retired immediately after the case, okay? And, and I think uh, he, his uh, last days are very sad, you know? The guilt of having so many people killed is carry with him forever, yeah. Okay, that's, that's Mulholland in, in, in not his later days, but, you know, when he was aged, okay? And, and this is really all that's remaining of the, the dam, yeah. And of course, today, if you go, you only see this part. All the rest are already eroded and disappeared. Okay. So this is this is uh, a very famous failed geotechnical case. And as I mentioned, geotechnical cases are usually very complicated, very difficult to to fight over. Okay. But but uh, you know it happens. Okay. And. Uh, one of the problems that I always criticize about construction residential is people are not willing to pay for initial geotechnical investigation. You know, many, many failures could have been avoided if they only 
have a few more bow holes, okay? But that, you know, bow holes are expensive. The, the, the money that people spend on studying the foundations before uh, the actual construction was less than 0.1% of the whole project cost. You know, that is not sufficient. But, uh, you know, people are always trying to cut corners. And during technical investigation is usually one of those areas. And so from that perspective, geotech has less reliability than uh, structural. Okay, both from materials more homogeneous and also from the uh, uncertainty in your, your knowledge of the site. Okay, so those are, are uh, very critical evidence and, and discussions that we need to have. Okay. Oh, so interestingly, at the same time of building the uh, famous St. Francis Dam, they actually are building another dam called the Maholland Dam. So it was named after him because he's such a well-known, distinguished engineer. They're actually building a dam named after him. Okay, And you can see it was built about the same time. Okay, And this is within LA City. Okay. And it's another concrete dam. This was done by him himself, Professor, or somebody else? I think it was designed, built by himself right. as well. Yeah, but they named after him. Okay, and then of course after the San Francisco dam fell, people start having questions about this dam. No, but this is uh, 1923, 1924. Yeah, before. about this. Uh, yes, yeah, before. before that one. Yeah, before. Because Almost is about the same. 26, yeah, built in 1926, yeah. But, uh, but then, after that dam was fell, people worry about this dam. So what they did is they actually asked them to, to put a lot of dead weight on the opposite side of the dam. Yeah, so this is, this is the, the, the lake side, the, the, the upstream. The downstream, they actually shored it up with many, many material, worried that it will fail. And, oh. Yeah, this is the last picture. So, so even though they they maintain his name on the dam, but exists, exist. exist. Yeah, this exists. never had no, problem. No problem. No problem. Yeah. Then it, that is, as you said, it is the geotechnical issue. Uh huh. This doesn't have any mica or. Uh, well, no, because it's uh, close by, so it may have, but may have. it doesn't have that much capacity. Much capacity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and not as big as the other dam. Yeah. So this, these are uh, interesting uh, geotechnical case studies that, uh, that just to show you, you know, the extent and also the, the, the complexity of geotechnical forensics. Uh, how about Hoover Dam, Professor? Uh, Hoover, Hoover Dam has no problem. No problem. No problem, yeah. In fact, uh, uh, Hoover Dam, you know, he named after Hoover and was very proud of that project, President Hoover, yeah. Uh, the, the entire project is very unique. It, it uh, has many, many engineering achievements on the Hoover Dam. But also the Hoover Dam, you, if you go there, so one of the, uh, the issue when, when we build the Hoover Dam is because the, the existing fault lines are, are very close to the dam. You know, so the dam was, had, had not failed in any ways. But the building of the dam was under a lot of stress because it was... That was challenging. Yes, right. very challenging, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, I have a, a separate set of uh, notes on the Hoover Dam, yeah. But because it didn't fail, so it was not a forensic case. <laughs> yeah. Not even single repair work has done. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But actually, the, now the, the argument about Hoover Dam is, uh, is it still necessary? Because now the Colorado River has dropped. Yeah, so there's not enough water. Yeah. Now it becomes a fight between Nevada and California because of the Colorado River. Yeah. Of the, yeah. So they are planning to uh, no no no. Nobody would dare to suggest, but they, they question, you know, why should we have a dam? Yeah. It it's not serving as much as what it used to, yeah. Now, another, another very important thing is, uh, uh, you know, because energy is not a big issue today, okay? 
And uh, in America, we have not built dams for many, many years because of environmental issue. Okay, but but now because of uh, uh, you know we're trying to avoid using fossil power generation, so hydropower is coming back. Okay, so uh, we may be seeing more dams being built now. Okay, and and of course then you you go into the same argument, you know. Are those engineers knowledgeable enough to build dams? Are they, you know, like Mulholland, want to challenge himself and build some dams that he has never seen or done before? So those are, are really critical questions because of the change of, um, of the, the politics and also the, the, the energy environment. Any questions about this? Yeah, Aspects. I think most most of the kids are structural. So yeah. Mm -hmm. What on the height of the dam? The height of the dam, which one? The old dam. Uh, the old dam. It was uh, it was 175 feet, and then they built this this particular one. Yeah. Oh, uh, I don't know. I don't know the detail about this less one. Than less than yeah, yeah. way less yeah. Half of it. Uh -huh. Not even 90 feet, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. It's a much smaller dam, yeah. Mm -hmm. That is actually 175, the earlier uh, dam. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> later on, uh, he increased the height suddenly with 10 feet. Mm -hmm. Whatever the approved one is only for 175 feet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But he, he himself approved it. <laughs> you know, he's the head engineer of the whole, yeah. He's the authority. Right. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, we are not in those day and age, but uh, this is a very high visible case. Yeah, I bet you the newspaper, would, his name is all over every day, yeah, because of this argument, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, um, I, I have never been involved in any famous case, so, you know, I've been, I have not been a star witness or you know star expert in any capacity but if you were one day being called to such a role you know can you imagine the pressure on you absolutely. As, absolutely and even in this day and age you know when the social media is very popular uh, I in that way we should be very very careful uh, absolutely yeah very very careful yeah mm -hmm. because the media the world, the world will be watching us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what uh -huh. is, what's his views? Yeah. We have to be very careful mm -hmm. uh, in releasing anything. Right, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's not easy uh, for, for this kind of case study. I don't know how will be the political pressure influence in the oh, United States. Yeah, we, uh, we it's very dominating. Absolutely, yeah. It's, it's in, in some cases dominating as well, yeah. As, like uh, the World Trade Center. After the 9/11, uh, oh, the the pressure is very high, yeah, especially to the investigators, because people criticize them as well, yeah. One set of people will be opposite. Mm -hmm. Yep. Who will be? Uh, who yeah. Has expertise in the same area. Right. He, uh, when we present something, he criticizes. Yeah, and they don't he criticize to your face. They write papers and they yeah go to conference and say you are not good. Yep. <laughs> 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 That's very terrible. Yeah, and, 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 but the, the more important problem is, you know, like the Pentagon case. So Pentagon case, uh, the airplane runs into the Pentagon, right? So you can literally see holes of the, the, when the fuselage ran in. And then so you literally see holes because it has many, many walls. So the holes getting smaller and smaller, but you don't see the whole integrate of the airplane because the airplane is already disintegrated. So how does it form those holes? You know, there are a lot of still unknown, and just because you cannot explain everything, people criticize you. Yeah. One general question, Professor. Yeah. Uh, as far as this geotechnical investigation is mm. concerned, when we go for any multi-story building construction yeah. or anything, when we do some uh, geotechnical uh -huh. 
the soil test. Yeah. Uh, they say that uh, if the soil strata go till the heart strata, go till the heart strata, uh -huh. and design uh, your okay. yep. foundation. Uh -huh. uh, like that, you, in case if the soil is weak. Yeah. Uh, if the bearing capacity. Yes. Yeah. You you drew it to the bedrock. Drew it to the bedrock. Right. Uh, but how how we can validate the strength of that bedrock process? Sometimes all oh, strata. No, no, there are there are they methods. Yeah. So you need to I don't know how much rock coring you actually do here, but when you drill it after you your soil is removed, then you need to drill into the rock. Into the rock. Yeah. Maybe how to see the yeah. Rock. And then the rock rock qualification is another set of science. You know, mechanics. yeah, raw mechanics, yeah. So yes, you can determine that, can yeah. Determine. Mm -hmm. yeah. And also, you know, not just drawing to the rock, but also how deep you need to pile, Suppose tie down. Suppose I have a, a situation like mm. that. Uh, my rock, that rock is not a granite material. Uh -huh. Some other thing, let us say, it is uh, It is not, uh, neither a sedimentary category yep. or a metamorphic category uh -huh. in between. Right. And we are not uh, satisfying that required uh, bearing uh, strength. Capacity, okay. Uh, in that <laughs> way, if I want to plan a 40 story building or a 50 story building mm. uh, over, uh, over that, yeah. uh, what will be the solution, Professor? What okay. can we do for that case? Okay. If the soil uh, bearing capacity is a bit poor. Yeah, then you, 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 you design the piles to go deep. Say, let yeah. us say uh -huh. it, is, uh, it is 20 meter deep. Uh -huh. uh, we got the hard strata in the 20 yeah. meter deep, but the hard strata is not uh, satisfactory. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, so we need to go deeper? Yes, you go deeper. Yeah. Might be, we will. And, and or, or add more piles. Okay. Yeah. So, so in pile design, there are, uh, there are several methods to, to strengthen your foundation. Uh, if you cannot go, if going deep, of course, but going deep only you know mean certain things, yeah. So if you have a high rise building, okay, of course you wanted the piles to go into the competent rock. Okay, so the design of the power group becomes critical because you, once you go to a certain depth, you know, you're approaching fixed end, right? But if you go way deeper, then there's no purpose, yeah. So you go to a reasonable depth, and then uh, if, if they are not strong enough to, to support the structure, then you add more house, yeah. And then also the, 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 the power group effect, Need to yeah. You need to compute yeah. You have to group the right yeah. There's group effect. But, uh, <laughs> can we do any strengthening technique at the base at the bedrock? Is it possible, professor? Grout. Uh, grout. Grout. Yeah. Lime. Lime grouting. Yeah. 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 You can you can grout the to make the the rocks more stronger. So sometimes you can blast blast up. You know, dynamite blast and then remove the material and then put grout. grout. Yeah. Mm -hmm. High strength concrete to grow it, yeah. So yeah, there is possibility of improving the design. And we need to, uh, we need enormous time to allow them to set, and then after fully set, we have to go for the construction. No, usually you 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 the grout will be, uh, well, settlement is totally different uh, kind of issue. I need them to set the concrete the setting. setting. Oh. Uh, not necessary, because it takes time to build build up, right? So usually, when you have the foundations already built, sufficient time, you know, at least definitely more than a week or so, you know, you already reached eighty percent the strength, yeah. And then then you start building up the top. So usually, by the time you start building the top, your foundation is already set, yeah. 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 Even the friction capacity is working. Why you want to have an uh, anchoring? Oh, because we the 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 uh, the 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 primus is high rise building. It's not uh, adequate to take care of uh, take that entire load. So we have only uh, this solution. Yeah. 
I mean, it's quite critical. So that's why I asked this yeah. question to Professor. What is his views about that? Right. I mean, even even if even if you have a compute, even if you have soil that has strong enough, so piles are, you know, piles are, especially for high, the deep, deep foundation, the piles are due to friction, resistance, and the pile tip resistance, right? So even if you have sufficient, because of you are a very high rise building, twenty story and above. You wanted to tie down to the bedrock as much as possible. Yeah. Negative friction. Huh? Negative friction. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Negative friction. Yeah. Uh, uh, you mean direction? Yeah. yeah. No. 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 Your load. Your dead load is coming down, right? So the yeah, negative friction. Negative friction. Yeah. Yeah. By friction pile. Yeah. So when the power is down, you know. When when the weight is pushing, the friction is preventing the power from settling. Yeah. When you are doing offshore special offshore design, uh -huh. it's very hard to make the bedrock. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Very interesting case. So the ground is sandy soil. The pond was nearby. Yeah. Because of that, it, the water starts the to coming out. It yeah. It was like a jet pump. Yep. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. So that was, that was a very and interesting. Uh, then he did some beep holes and he uh, allowed uh, right. uh, drainage. Right. Yep. Yeah. And, and then you, you put heavy weights heavy on weights. top. Yeah. And uh, it was rectified. <laughs> that was a very interesting. Very interesting <laughs> case. Yep. Uh huh. Yep. Sometimes we don't know what is the root cause of the problem, but if we go a little bit deep, yeah, the I mean, will be very simple. Right, yeah. We can rectify it very easily. Yes, yeah, yeah. So, so uh, I often ask uh, CN, so his uh, problem-solving technique is very creative. You know, I'm always curious what the Western engineers would do, yeah. Like like that particular case, I will probably find out where the groundwater is coming from, and I will cut out cut that off, right? Instead of just solving this problem, yeah. But he he solved the problem, so yeah, yeah. Even he right, yeah. Uh huh. So yeah. He gave the project. Keep the train. The water uh huh. Ready. Yep. <laughs> Any other questions? Good. Yeah, I, I know that uh, geotech is probably a little bit odd, but... Uh, uh, no, sir, but we should know... You should know, yeah. Uh -huh. We cannot fully rely on uh, geotechnical experts. Right, yeah, yeah. Even they themselves, they don't have answers right. for certain questions. Yeah, and absolutely, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, that is the thing. At least yeah. uh, we can have some slight knowledge right. yep. on that. Mm -hmm. yep. and, and of course, I only demonstrate one geophysical method the more common method is you drill a hole and then you put the sensors down the drain. Yeah. And then you, you use stress wave to, to detect change. Okay. So but those those are techniques are much more expensive. For only high profile case they will allow that. How yeah. about electrical resistivity methods? Electrical resistivity methods are very good in soil, soil. not for uh, rock. Oh. Yeah. So soil it, it's very good in determining the uh the capacity of the soil, soil density, and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. Now, yeah, that's that's one technique available that can be done. Yeah. Be cheap and best. Cheaper, much cheaper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other questions? No. Okay. Uh, as a reminder, your homework is due today. The uh, point cloud analysis. <laughs> Uh, how many of you have finished? Oh, well, the file is not opening. You should have asked Nevani. Yeah. Is there to help you, right? Yeah. Already tutored you a mail, whatever the. No, no. FLS file supports. Yeah. By by cloud compare. Yeah. By 19 to process. Okay. And tomorrow uh -huh. they can give their uh, seminar presentation. Right, right. Uh, the case study presentation you get you get ready by tomorrow. Yeah. The groups, mm -hmm. so that we will uh, we can have a review after immediately after lunch, uh, we can have. And Thursday you can finish your uh, homework. Uh, homework. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. If there is any doubt, you please uh, ask now. If he's there, uh, to help you. Yeah. 7 p.m. Okay. He's there. Yeah. So you can <laughs> sit with him, or you can come over here, yeah. and mm -hmm. you can you can have a discussion uh, with him, or right. you can go to the guest house, yeah. and you can have a discussion. Yeah. When when you come to lunch, you know usually that's a very good time to ask so him questions. So if you yeah. have doubts, you should not have kept with yeah. you, so <laughs> you could, uh, uh, We are in a depression that you you have completed. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. So Yeah, I I'm, I can guarantee you when you guys go out within five years, you'll be starting to see people submitting Definitely. point cloud. So knowing at least get a little bit, we're not asking too much, just a little bit of experience would be sufficient for you to 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 manage those kind of data.
Okay, so that's why we, we insist on you doing this homework. Okay. Yeah. yeah, any question, please ask uh, Navanit. Friday's lecture alone, we will start uh -huh. uh, somewhere around uh, some uh, 40 minutes advanced. Normally, we have it uh, around uh, 11 a.m. So, we will start around 10 20 or something, 10 15 or 10 yeah. 20, mm -hmm. so that we can uh, wind up before uh, 12 15 or something. And then, uh, half an hour, we will have a small objective test, whatever you have mm -hmm. gone through the slides and everything. Yeah. Is done. Mm -hmm. so the questions will be based on uh, those things your materials is given to you so that uh, we'll have a, it will be like 30 odd objective questions. Uh, it's not, uh, you won't require less than 30 minutes. So we'll yeah. have a 30 mm -hmm. minutes quick. 25 questions. 25, 20. 25 questions yeah. you can take for 30 minutes. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then we will discuss for lunch. After that, we'll come and uh, we'll distribute the certificates and uh, we'll honor the professor. Yeah. And we'll mm -hmm. close the program after our uh, lunch. So by the time, uh, I think these two days will be little bit, uh, uh, what to say, lots of works mm -hmm. you, you are, and tasks you are uh, about to complete it. So yeah. mm -hmm. uh, uh, please uh, get it first as, as much as possible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so then we also will be having satisfaction that you have some mm -hmm. amount of knowledge. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. where, uh, the purpose of this course will be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. that's, yeah. uh, that's on the so any doubts, uh, you are welcome. Uh, and uh, if you have any technical issue, doubts, and other things regarding the four and six in the slides, you can interact with Professor. Or uh, the practical doubts, whatever in the software, you can contact now. And mm -hmm. If there is any discrepancy in the assignments, if you are unable to follow certain terminologies, uh, you are free to ask. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I think okay, uh, yeah, we'll we will conclude on, uh, here, but uh, yeah, we will stay a little longer for you to ask yeah. them any questions. Sure. Yeah.